Matt Mayoko. Do you realize it's been about a decade since you and I have talked, man? I, I really mean it. I went to 95. Since we've talked? Game. Huh? Well, since we've talked on the air. Since, yeah. since we've done an interview in person. Yes. Wow. I mean, of course, we say hello to each other. Yes. Yeah. But this is the first time the gift that is you and I talking <laughs> about the 49ers can be given to the public in like a decade. Yes. It's been 10 years since I, 2013. I will say this, that people still call me the Cobra. And that was that was all you. All I can tell you is that. Do we need to tell the story? Well, please go ahead. Let yeah. everyone know. So I the this one season. Well, it was probably the. Oh, I don't know. It was a long time ago. Let's say fifteen years ago, maybe even more. Um, the Mike Nolan era. It was the Mike Nolan era. Yeah, there was a player on the 49ers, wide receiver, who was always going around drinking some concoction, some supplements, and I'd see him over there putting all kinds of stuff, dry ingredients into this big plastic see-through, whatever it was, a uh, water bottle. And then he'd go over and fill it up and he'd start shaking it. And one day I went over and I said, Hey, wh what's up? What's, what's, where are all the supplements? What, what, what's in this? And he went through it and he, he stopped at one. And he goes, uh, he goes, uh, this is Cobra. Do you know about Cobra? I don't even know if they still make the supplement. I should have Googled it before I got on here. With you. <laughs> but I, I go, no, I've never heard of Cobra. And he goes, well, you know what Viagra is? I go, yeah, I know what Viagra is. And he goes, well, this is, this is all natural. And this is better than Viagra. And he goes, you married? And I go, yep, I'm married. And he goes, you'll be. And he did this like karate kick into the air and he's like, you'll be kicking down your bedroom door and your wife will be so happy. And, all this <laughs> stuff. and I'm just going, wow. Okay. All right. Well, you know, good, good, good to talk to you. Uh, anyway, I think he got even a little bit more graphic of all the things that Cobra would allow me to do. And then that day, as he's walking past me, he's leaving the locker room and he goes, he goes, Hey, yo, he goes, you don't have to say anything if you take my advice, but next time you see me, just go, yo, J-Mo, and he makes the Cobra signal. Of course, the player, I think people might be able to figure out is Johnny Morton. But I told you that story, and I th I'm sure I told it over a period of time, and you'll know, just kind of set it up and all that stuff. We were in the bleachers during training camp in Santa Clara, and the next time I had or I was on your show, you introduced me. And then you, you said, you know, joining us now is Matt Mayoko. And then you did this dramatic pause and you said, the Cobra. <laughs> and I started, I lost it. And so people, it started because we were on a lot. People would come up to me and go, Hey, Cobra, you know, people still call me Cobra. I swear to you, some people still call me Cobra and they go, Hey, you know, how'd you get that nickname? Is it because you strike fast and like, yeah, something like that. So I've never really told the whole story. That's the whole story. Well, and then you and I have always used this as our official greeting to each yeah. other. The, yeah. The cobra, the cobra with the wave. Yeah. And I guess the only follow-up question that the audience really needs to know is, uh, how's, how's Mrs. Mayoko doing? <laughs> yeah, <geez. laughs> Well, I mean uh, it, man. It, it's so good to see you. It's been such a long time since we've been able to do this. And I tell you, you know, I, I was thinking about time and how much time you and I uh, have been apart from each other. And then I was thinking about how much time you have spent around Kyle Shanahan. Going back to our first year together, mm -hmm. um, you know, Kyle's starting to feel the weight of history. Like, it is every coach is under pressure, obviously. I don't think Kyle is in any way, you know, uh, uh, reapplying for his job after the Trey Lance fiasco. Jed York is very happy with Kyle Shanahan. We know that. Yeah. And he should be. Yes, frankly, but the weight of history being a coach's son and the fact that he's going into year seven really does open up a different level of personal pressure that he probably is putting on himself. Forget about all the outside influences. Matt, you and I got three years of Mike Nolan together. We got two-ish seasons of Mike Singletary together. We got a couple games from Tom Sula first time around. Four years out of Harbaugh. Tom Sula 2.0 lasted one year. Chip Kelly lasted one year. Kyle's going into year seven. Yeah. 
You know this guy and have been around him professionally more than any other head coach you have ever covered. Wow. Are, are you feeling a difference in his approach to this season, this year? Are you looking at a more paranoid guy than from year one, less paranoid? Talk to me about the evolution of Kyle as you've covered him and where he stands, you think, mentally going into year seven. Yeah, well, I, I would say this, that the, the trade of Trey Lance to the Cowboys, to me, is a move made by a general manager and a head coach who believe they have all the job security in the world. Because if, if they were, if they felt like there was any, and not even a hot seat, even if there was a lukewarm seat, that is not a trade that they would make because you would be, you would want to just kick the can down the road because that's a, a seminal moment for these two individuals trading up to number three to get Trey Lance and then just, you know, sending him off two years in. So to me, that, that shows a level of confidence that uh, th they have the full reins to do whatever they want with that team. And I think that's a good thing uh, from the standpoint of before Lynch and Shanahan got here, what was the major complaint about Jed York was that he was too involved. You know, he was putting himself out there as kind of the face of the franchise more than he should have been as an owner. And now, you know, Jed York has taken a back seat. I think there has been this evolution of Kyle Shanahan from the sense of he came in in 2017, got the job after telling Jed York his team sucked and it was a horrible team and they need six year contracts. They got the six year contracts. And so it, the, that first year was extremely rough. I think 0 and 9 or whatever it was, 0 and 8 to, to right. begin. And then, so there was, even though there was no pressure, he still felt the pressure because they were losing and there wasn't a whole lot good going on. The fact that they got into the Super Bowl year three, way ahead of expectations, um, what that did was it did kind of ramp up uh, the, the ratcheted up the intensity, the expectations, and I'd say the pressure too. And so I, I do think when you get to the NFC Championship game three times in four years, you have you have uh, earned a lot of credit. Um, you've you've done a lot of winning to get there. You're doing a lot of things right. You're doing a heck of a lot more things right than wrong. But also when you get that far in the postseason. Only to lose. I mean, every year, those three years, they win two games, they lose a game. They win two games, they lose a game, they win two games, they lose a game. That's got to take a toll because as soon as you walk off the field in Philadelphia, you're you're tied for, you know, you're tied with 32 other teams or 31 other teams with a zero and zero record. And it is no small feat to get back there. So I, I do sense you know, it's seven years in, maybe he's a little bit more hardened, uh, a little bit more, I don't know if on edge would be the right term. I mean, we got into a little, I don't know if you saw this on Wednesday, yeah. you know, I got into a little back and forth, which we, we have, I mean, I have tremendous respect for Kyle. And I think I, I would, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that he, acknowledges that you know i i kind of know what i'm i'm doing as well so the thing i like about him is that we can have either privately or in this case in front of a press conference which i i don't like being you know the guy at press conferences who sticks his chest out and does that i i'd rather do that behind closed doors but we do have the relationship where if one guy isn't real pleased with how the other person is is doing something we can reach out and we he can, you know, he can tell me. Matt, for those who, who didn't see what you're talking about, yeah. you're back and forth in the press conference. Would you, would you tell yeah, them? What uh, absolutely. So Jimmy Garoppolo earlier this week um, said that, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird situation in San Francisco. It, it has been a number of weird situations. And so I was, he, and Kyle was asked about that. And it, clearly he bristled uh, when, when it was mentioned, you know, what Jimmy Garoppolo had said. Um, I kind of got the sense that, um, not that I didn't already figure this, but kind of got the sense that, uh, you know, Kyle's kind of done with Jimmy Garoppolo, that maybe he's felt like he's had Jimmy's back 
like through a lot of seasons and uh in the, the you know J- jim i don't think jimmy is is kyle's kind of guy you know I, I mean i think there's still a lot of feelings in the organization about you know they they make jimmy garoppolo the highest paid quarterback in the league highest paid player in the league that didn't last very long but they still gave him a really good contract and then you know they couldn't get a hold of him in the offseason you know he he doesn't return text messages he doesn't return phone calls and i think a lot of people are like geez that's that's weird we just made him the highest paid player in the league and he's not he's ghosting us and <laughs> what does that mean so i i mentioned to kyle i said you know you, you gotta kind of admit this hasn't worked out the way you know you anticipated with the quarterback situation so it is kind of weird and i think you know he takes weird meaning negative connotations right he really kind of you know jumped back at me well what do you think and i said well i think it is weird and he and he said that you know yes i guess it's it's a strange situation whenever you get rid of your quarterback that you pick number three overall so we went back and forth and he got a i don't know, I don't know if it'd be tense but it, we just put a little bit more out there in a press conference than what you ordinarily see. Well, I think you were both defending the position you were representing. And yeah. did it, I mean, it, it, to me, it wasn't awkward. I mean, by the way, if this happened in Philadelphia, no one would even notice. It just shows yeah. you how, you know, uh, the soft approach to everything on the West Coast tends to be. I mean, it didn't stand out to me as awkward or confrontational. It was a, an honest exchange between two people who, like I've said, have been in each other's faces now going into year seven. I mean, it's like yeah. a marriage between you two at this yeah, point. Yeah, it kind of is. And I, you know, I honestly, I don't know how it came off. I just know how it, it felt. But anyway, it ended with me saying, I think he asked me a question. I said, well, you got to admit, it's been unique. And then he kind of pointed at me and goes, that's the word. I agree. Unique. And they walked off. Uh, I mean, the press conference was over. But um, it, it just, I guess it's semantics. Right. Um, in and I guess you know his point would be weird means negative, but the things the 49ers have done at that position aren't negative. You know, the, the moves they've made at, at quarterback haven't set the team back, you know, unless I mean that revisionist history. I mean, they can go back and we can all look at moves they could have, should have made. Everybody in the world should have traded up to number nine or number 10 to get Patrick Mahomes in 2017. The, the first quarterback off the board was Mitchell Trubisky, who the Bears traded with the 49ers to get in front of to pick. I'm so, familiar with that move, yes. So, you know, the, the, all that stuff's revisionist history. But I guess what I'm saying is, and, and what – Kyle would say is that every time they've they've done something a quarterback they've done it for a reason uh, you know they felt that that was the best move to make at that time and now you know based on how Brock Purdy played the end of last season that was the best move probably the only move they could make was to go, head into 2023 with Brock Purdy as a starting quarterback which then really makes Trey Lance completely expendable because a year ago they were setting up the offense for Trey Lance. And now the offense is set up for Brock Purdy. And so who do you have as the backup behind Brock Purdy? Someone more like Brock Purdy or someone who does completely different things, different skill sets like Trey Lance. And so they opted to uh, you know, consult with Trey and he, he preferred to leave and I don't blame him. And I, you know, uh, the 49ers felt that that was the best thing for their organization as well. Um, I just, and I guess that's probably the right move, even though it was only for a fourth round pick. But that's the part that kind of like, when I look at this, that's the part where I think is, is reasonable to debate is that why not just kick the can down the road a little bit and just give yourself a little bit more time to see if this could work out. Right. I mean, it's easy to criticize all the investment they made yeah. into the wrong player, but to come in in the back end and say, well, did you lose a little patience? I mean, it's, it's all legit. And yeah. you know, in the parlance of our times, it is a unique situation. Yeah. I mean, I've never is it seen weird though. Like, Damon, is it weird or unique? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, we'll get to another weird and unique situation in, in just a bit here, as we're talking on the morning of August thirty first, and Nick Bosa has yet to even report. So, we'll get to that in a second. But while we're talking quarterbacks. 
your thumbnail sketch of Brock Purdy's 2023. What's your expectation? And what is balancing that with the reality of the league now having some film on this kid? And that means the game of catch up to whatever Brock Purdy offered is unique has begun by the NFL. You know what? I, I, I almost think that, and this is given a lot of credit to Kyle Shanahan, that as long as Brock Purdy can just do the things he did last year, there's always going to be guys open. So it's not like a team can go in and say, well, these are the throws that Purdy makes. Let's take those away from him. Well, they can't take away all those throws. They can't take away all those weapons. There's going to be, you know, among Kyle Juszczyk, Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and Debo Samuel. And then when uh, Juszczyk leaves the field, here comes Juwan Jennings. You can't take away all those options. So I don't, I don't really see that as something where teams are going to watch all the film of Brock Purdy based on last year and go, we got it. This is how you defend him because he can't do this. He can't do that. Um, it's not really just him. It's it, all of them. It's <laughs> all of them. And it's, and it's the playbook. It's the concepts. It's setting up one play, showing another. It's, it's a lot that teams have to – to take away. And I, and from that standpoint, as long as Brock Purdy can see it and deliver it and make quick decisions, I think he'll be fine. And, and I think that that's the one area where just uh, taking what he's been taught or what he's been advised to look for from the meeting room to the practice field, to the games that's where I see Brock Purdy being the guy that Kyle Shanahan wanted when they, you know, they signed Jimmy Garoppolo to that long-term deal. I think that there are a lot of elements that Jimmy Garoppolo did that were very good. And I think if you probably watched the games, you'd be by and large, very happy with Garoppolo. But I think behind the scenes, there was a lot of stuff going on where we told him that play would be there and he still didn't see it. You know, I, I think there's a lot of that. And then with Trey Lance, I mean, we just don't know. You know, we just don't know. He wasn't as accurate as they wanted him to be. He wasn't as crisp with the decision-making. And I'd say both of those things are a direct result of, you know, the, the, maybe the accuracy to a lesser degree. But I think both those things were a direct result of him just not playing a whole lot of football, you know, from, from college to his first two years in the pros, just not playing a lot of football. So um, what can they expect from Brock Purdy? A pass-first point guard who finds the open guy, regardless of where that open guy is in the progression. Well, that's what they need. If you if you had to boil it down, like what's your elevator pitch on Kyle Shanahan as a head coach? I would simply say this. He runs dudes open. He's got open receivers all over the field. He always has. He always will. There's someone open in this offense, and Kyle creates mismatches. And if he's got a quarterback who can exploit them, that's how it that that's how it works for the 49ers. Uh, yeah, and just one one other thing yeah. about that. It also, behind closed doors, he does a great job of explaining that to his players. And so they he has some really smart football players and some guys who are getting smarter by the day, and he's able to tell them the whys and and that makes a big difference because it's all you know a guy like Christian McCaffrey steps in and he's just been in awe of the amount of learning that he's done so these guys know what they're doing and why they're doing it and those are two important things there's that kind of ownership that they buy into we'll get to McCaffrey in a second but we got to get to Bosa Wednesday the team acknowledged they want him in they're trying to close the gap in this negotiation. What is the final hurdle, Matt? And assuming they leap over that hurdle, what is a real expectation of Bosa week one in Pittsburgh? Uh, I mean, the, both sides haven't let very many details or any details really get out. But, you know, it always comes down to money. There's a reason that um, you know, there's a reason that he isn't here. And, and it's clear that they haven't decided on the, the the money they haven't found that common ground there's like three different ways to satisfy him right because it's got to be you got to be the highest paid defensive player in football history in somehow or way total value annual average value or guaranteed dollars all the above 
at best, you can pick two, but you can't have all three is, is the way I feel it goes. Yeah, and I mean, I, I could see where the 49ers would push back on, you know, the apples and oranges aspect of the Aaron Donald deal. You know, that he was coming off a Super Bowl. He had already been three-time league defense player of the year. Uh, he was threatening retirement, and it's a shorter-term deal. So would, probably T.J. Watt would be the, the contract that the, would be the, the better comp. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. But, uh, you know, Nick Bosa's agent, uh, Brian Arald, is, is a hardball negotiator. The 49ers have a lot of highly paid players on the team, and there's room for at least one more with Nick Bosa. Now, it might mean that another player in the next year, uh, not this year, but next year or the year after, two players or whatever, some of those players might have to go, especially when you look at, you know, Brandon Ayuk is going to be due for a, a new contract a year from now. So, you know, I know Prog Marate always has like a three-year plan of this is the, the roster composition and the salaries and this and that. And so they're just trying to make Nick Bosa's contract fit in so that they don't have to, it doesn't have to be too painful for them down the road. So where it goes, I, I have no idea. I mean, I guess I would expect him to be ready to play week one. Um, I think a lot of, you know, most people believe he'll be there week one, but how it gets there and what it looks like that remains to be seen. And then the, the other part of this is when is, when is it too late for him to, to step on the field and make an impact? I mean, I, I've kind of said this tongue in cheek, but maybe not really. I felt like, I mean, he, this guy could sign on, you know, Saturday, September 9th and play and play the next day and, and be very effective. Now he might feel like hell on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, but he's a freak. And right. so he will come in with 0% body fat. He will yeah. report prepared for duty. Absolutely. So I do think that as long as they can get him pen to paper before the game, there will be, I think there will be some role for him. There will be some role for him in the game. Sunday. Steve Wilkes has got to just be salivating. I mean, thinking of all the twisting that you can do with Armstead and Hargrave and Bosa. I mean, it. this is either going to be the most fearsome defensive line in football or, oh my God, Nick Bosa held out the entire year. The 49ers aren't going to the Super Bowl and Kyle Shanahan's hot seat does become something to discuss. Like to me, Bosa is like an event horizon now. You can't walk away from two top three picks. <laughs> in the same week, basically. And after what's happened with Trey Lance, they are, they're so pot committed to Nick Bosa. They just got to get this done. We all know that. I, I think as we look at media, always trying to find the story before it actually happens, Cobra to me, the least reported upon most under the radar story of this entire lead up, because we've been so distracted with Lance and Bosa and constant Kyle, whatever, and the picks and the trade. I mean, like we only talk about this team in terms of four different subjects, it seems. Mm -hmm. And we do not give the attention to Christian McCaffrey that he truly deserves. I think he is in for a monster, monster, monster season. Like you were saying, his smarts and knowledge a full year into Kyle's playbook now has to mean something. And he was basically instant dividends, having seen four pages of the playbook when he arrived and just started looking like the most electric player we've seen in a Niners uniform in a really long time. I think he's going to have an MVP conversation type of season, a monster year from Christian McCaffrey. You got that inkling too? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's, a, it's a matter of can can he stay healthy? You know, right. It's going to take a lot of, you know, it, they got to really manage him. You know, it's a 17 game season, and then you know, 49ers expect to be playing in the in the postseason too. But I, I would say the reason that a lot of people aren't talking, and most people aren't, unless it's fantasy owners who have him as what their number one or number two pick on the board, is because he's so good, and there just aren't many questions about him. I mean, we saw, like you said, we saw what he did last season after that first game where he showed up on a Friday and played 22 snaps. And then probably not a big coincidence that the next week, the 49ers went on this roll. Um, he does, you know, whatever term you want, he unlocks everything about He's the skeleton offense. key. He's the he skeleton is. key that unlocks every door yeah. of Kyle's offensive imagination. And, and this was the guy, I think it was Kyle's second year 
uh, it was his third year, third year uh, in free agency, he went out and got Jarek McKinnon. That's the guy that he wanted because he right. saw Jarek McKinnon, a guy who could be an okay running back, but a really good weapon coming out of the backfield and create, creating mismatches. And it never worked out for Jarek McKinnon and the 49ers because of injuries. Now Jarek McKinnon's a really good player with Kansas City and helping them win Super Bowls. But he finally got the guy he wanted, but only this guy is a heck of a lot better than Jarek McKinnon. I mean, this guy can run between the tackles. He can run outside. He can catch passes lined up at any number of positions. He, he's, he's the equivalent of Debo Samuel only flipped, you know, the running back that plays like a wide receiver as well. And a guy that is on the clock 12 months a year. Like he is, he does not get out of shape at any point and watching him, in training camp was kind of a treat because this is the first time we've had the opportunity to do that. And so you see how seriously he takes it. You see what kind of shape his body is in. So, yeah, no, I would agree. If, you know, if, if I were a betting man, I, I might be tempted to, to put a couple of dollars on Christian McCaffrey being NFL offensive player of the year. Um, as we spent the entire summer debating the lack of value given to running backs. Yes. Are we about to go forward with a conversation about how defensive ends are overpaid now? I mean, it feels like when Bosa gets this deal, it's going to be a, a, a you know, there's going to be sticker shock on that number. And people are going to say, is he your starting quarterback? And you'll say, no, as a matter of fact, he doesn't even touch the ball unless he hops on a fumble. Um, we just spent the entire off season talking about the lack of value for running backs. Are we about to start talking about how defensive players are, are now being overpaid? Uh, you know, I don't think so because I think it really is an important position. It's probably the second most important position in all of football um, because it's, it's all about, do you have a quarterback? If you can check that box, then it's how can we get a player on the other side of the ball to affect the other team's quarterback. And I, I think, you know, with, with defensive ends, you can get better over time. And the, the thing that kind of separates running backs is that you can have a great season as a running back and, and rush, you know, have 320 carries and rush for 1,600 yards. And the perception of that is, well, he's done. He'll never be able to do that again because of the wear and tear. And so running back is, is probably literally the only position in sports where if you have a lot of success, it doesn't set you up for future success. Right. You know, so like, oh, you know, if, if he had had I'm only a hundred carries, you. <laughs> well, yeah, it works against you. It's, and it's like in contract negotiations, well, you ran for 1800 yards last year and you scored 23 touchdowns. So that means that uh, you're not going to be as good this year because of the wear and tear that your body had last year. So it, it's just a weird position. And so that's why, you know, th they need to do a good job and of with McCaffrey of just kind of managing those carries. And if Elijah Mitchell can get healthy and stay healthy, you know, mix him in there and, and either Ty Davis price or, or Jordan Mason. But um, I do think that a defensive end is that, that position that, it's the quarterback, really, the quarterback equivalent on the other side of the ball because if, if you can get after the quarterback, make him uncomfortable, that helps everybody on your defense, specifically the two cornerbacks and the safeties, you know, to go and get their hands on some footballs. And then if you bring over more pass protection, that opens it, opens it up for, you know, your linebackers and your other defensive linemen. I know you got to get going down to Santa Clara, and I, I said we'd, we'd go about a half an hour, and we have. Are, by the way, am, am I in the Cobra breakfast nook right now? Are we breakfast kind of, nooking? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I like the breakfast nook. I like I, I like the yeah, just here. I right before you got on, I thought I'd like uh, squeeze in a, a bagel, and so I ate half of my bagel. This is a, uh, a cinnamon raisin bagel with peanut butter on it. That's my uh, my power breakfast. That is, a, you, you should be set up well for the day. The <laughs> fact that you left half of your bagel to get cold to talk to me yeah. 
is a huge honor. So thank you very much. No one likes a cold bagel, so I thank you deeply. Yeah, um, that's, that's what Cobra does. <laughs> I was going to ask you, you know, a little bit about Fred Warner or Talanoa Hufanga, who I think is a huge difference maker this year. Jair Brown, I think, is about to 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 play a significant role in this season. But instead of asking you about those individuals, I'd like to ask you about Steve Wilkes and the difference you think he brings. Are we going to see a more aggressive, more blitz-heavy Fred Warner up the middle, uh, a- aggressive blitz package, or is he going to sit back in base and hope the D-line just does its job? I think it'll be it'll be more aggressive. It might not be every game. I think he's going to be very strategic and, and find weaknesses in opposing offenses and in their pass protections and all that. And so I, I don't think it's going to be like, you know, Blitzburg, it's not going to be crazy blitzing. Um, and once may, maybe they'll have to do a little bit more before, you know, when uh, if Bosa isn't around and maybe even a little bit more in those first few games where he's, he's with the team, but you know, ultimately you want your front four to carry the day. You know, you want those guys to get to the quarterback, but I do think that, that he, there will be games where he'll see something. It might not be every game where they're blitzing, you know, whatever, 10, 12 times a game. Uh, but there will be games where he will he will dial that up, but it'll be very strategic. He, he's a uh, he's an impressive guy. And the, the thing that was really interesting to watch in training camp was just how hands-on he is with the defensive back. So those young guys, you know, Charverius Ward, although he's not necessarily a young guy, but right. you know, or Lenore and Ambry Thomas and Samuel Womack, I mean, he was with those guys a lot going through some very – specific technical stuff before practices. So I, I think he I think at this point where the 49ers are, it's probably uh it might be beneficial. Now, you know, uh, D'Amico Ryan's uh, got the head coaching job. Uh, players raved about him, but I, I think it's it's good to maybe bring in a new face. Now all that said, I, I don't know that the 49ers defense will be better uh this year. I, I think there will probably be a drop off. But they maybe they can be more effective and generate more takeaways, although they did a, a good job of that last year. But I think there will be more opportunities for them to be aggressive and bring blitzes at the opposition. Just get off the field, baby. That's the name of the game. It is so good to catch up with you, Cobra. Uh, you sight for sore eyes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your time. Have a great day down in Santa Clara. Look, I mean, the NFL did the 49ers no favors at the beginning of the season. Two road games and then a Thursday nighter for your first home game against the Giants. Um, it, it's it, They're thrown right into the fire, and it's going to be a fascinating season. You are state-of-the-art at, at what you do. You are the Helen Thomas of uh-huh. those uh, th- those press conferences. You get the first question. You've earned that, and you tell Kyle to not answer any of your questions with any smart-ass questions, and you tell him I said so. <laughs> oh, I like it. Hey, if I, if I dish it out, I can take it too. So I, I – I'm fine with Kyle Shanahan. I think he's, I think he handles the media very well. He does. I mean, he's he really very does. He filibusters a little, but he also, there is a little teaching going on in there. Yeah, there really, there's an attempt to clarify what he means. And I'll tell you what I also detect. I got a good press conference bullshit detector. Uh-huh. You could feel the regret of the Trey Lance trade yeah. in that presser. You could, you could feel his personal uh, accountability that he let this situation down. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that he felt like, you know, gosh, this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. You know, what could I have done differently? And I'm not sure there, I mean, other than I mean, he got injured. Uh, you know, what could he have done differently? Not have Brock Purdy play so damn well. You right. Know, that's what. And then I, I, I differently. Just take Jamar Chase at three. Just well, <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> and then for Kyle, or for uh, John Lynch, I, I could sense the real emotion of. God, you know, gosh, we we hate to lose. You know, we hate that it didn't work out here, and he's somewhere else. And they liked having this that guy in the building, Trey Lance, good good kid. Yeah. I never heard a bad thing about him. So you know, I I mean, it took the the forty hours a while to to get up there and kind of explain their side of it. But once they did, and that was after that game Friday night, I think both Lynch and Shanahan handled it honestly, and they handled it very well. Good to talk to you, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Have a good one. Enjoy your bagel. (laughs) 
Oh, listen to that crunch. Somebody made a good bagel this morning.